Okay, thanks very much everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking tonight about the top topic of monads. Uh, and this talk is called Go Mad for Monads. A um, little something about myself. My name is Warren. I'm the lead developer at a company called Radify. Uh, you can get in touch with me over email there and find me on Twitter as well. Uh, we're always recru recruiting for new developers. So if you find what I talk about tonight interesting, you want to write code like this, you get excited about code like this, give me a shout and um, maybe you can come work with us. Um, so I just want to have a little bit of a preamble about the idea of pure functions. Um, so this is the idea that if you've got some function that takes some arguments, A, B, and C, uh, that it's just going to return some kind of single value and that for any kind of inputs A, B, and C, you're always going to return the same value. There's no kind of side effects there. You're not going to write to a database or write to file or just do something beyond the context of that function. So there are some rules to writing these kind of pure functions. The first is that you can't cheat and pass these variables by reference. You can only pass by value. Um, and you can only rely on those arguments that were passed in. So you can't rely on globals. You can't rely on any um, object properties or static class properties. Um, and that's quite a big restriction, but this kind of thing allows you to write some code that's really easy to test and really easy to debug. Um, and it's also really easy to cache these kinds of methods because it essentially means that if you've got any set of arguments, whenever the values of those arguments are the same, you can just cache that result and return it without actually having to invoke the logic within the function. Um, so that's also desirable because caching is, is hard. Um, but there are some restrictions. Um, you can't do anything practical. Um, you imagine, for example, file get contents. You give it a file name argument. Um, there is context there. The context is the contents of the file that you're trying to access. So even though you could ask to get the contents of file foo.txt twice, you can't make any guarantees that that function is going to return the same value both times because the file itself could have changed. Um, and the same idea with talking to a database or any kind of I.O. really. You're talking to the rest of the world, and the world is beyond the control of that function. And even simple things like time and generating random numbers are going to return different things every time you call them. So this is a problem that's um, plagued the functional programming world for a long, long time. Um, we like pure functions. They're easy to reason about, but they make it very hard to do stuff that interacts with the real world. Um, and so monads were come up to address this problem. Um, and so if you, you may see um, monads, as functional programming continues its uh, revival and its renaissance, um, monads become more and more talked about. And you probably heard the term. Maybe you've even Googled the term. And you ask, what is a monad? You get told that in order to understand monads, you have to understand Haskell. Um, you have to understand category theory and other higher level mathematical concepts. Uh, you may get told something incredibly obnoxious, like a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Um, and you may get some really sort of esoteric notations, and you may see some Haskell function definitions as well. Um, as PHP programmers, this stuff is of no help to us. So Douglas Crockford, a very prominent uh, JavaScript developer, uh, came up with uh, this idea about these monads. I call it Crockford's paradox. Um, and he says that monads are cursed. Once you fully understand and appreciate monads, you completely lose the ability to explain them to other people. Yeah. So it may seem kind of pointless that why am I up here trying to explain what these things are? Uh, well, I think I found a loophole. Um, I don't fully understand them yet. Um, so I'm just going to tell you what I've learned about them so far, then you can fill in the blanks, and then we can all know about monads together. Um, and it's interesting that I found this loophole because monads are themselves a loophole in this whole idea of a functional contract. Um, and they give you a way to write pure functions that are able to talk to the real world and have some kind of practical benefit. So monads essentially begin with this idea of three fundamental functions. Um, there is a unit function, there is a bind function, and then there is a function that is passed as an argument to bind. And so the idea here is that if we call the unit function on some value and then we bind, um, so we call the unit function on some value, that creates a monad. And then we can then call the bind function on that monad with some other function. And the value that's passed into that function will be the same as the value that we passed into unit. And all three of these functions return a new monad. Uh, 
Um, and we all know um, that any kind of function that returns some kind of new thing is generally considered a constructor. And so we can reason that all monads are constructors. Um, but it's important to know that not all constructor functions are monads. Uh, a constructor can return anything. So they're not all monads. But so in order for some kind of object constructor to be a monad, it has to meet some kind of fundamental, fundamental behaviors. They're called axioms. And there are three of these basic axioms. So the first is that if we call the unit function on some value and then bind some function to it, that's the exact equivalent of calling that function on that value. Okay? And then second of all, if we try to bind the unit function to some monad, we just get the original monad back unchanged. And the third one's a little bit tricky, and at this point it's not going to make much sense, and even I have trouble understanding that one. But essentially, if we bind some function to an existing monad, and then take that result and bind a function to that, it's the equivalent of saying, write some arbitrary function where we bind a function with the original value and bind a function to that and then bind it to the original monad. It's, it, I still have trouble, I have trouble explaining it. I have trouble fully understanding it in that notation. Um, and so it can get a little bit tricky to follow. But fortunately, um, object-oriented design can come to help us in this case. Um, now, what we can do here is treat this monad thing as a class. Now, classes and object-oriented design is usually considered the polar opposite of functional programming. And so it's not very often that you find that classes can solve these kinds of problems. But even in a language like uh, Haskell, which is full-on pure functional programming, you have this concept of type classes. And these are these very abstract things that are essentially just data structures that behave in certain ways. So they are a lot like classes and objects, but they're much more um, simpler in their intent. And so we can consider monads one of these type classes. Um, so what we can do is we can write a class for these monads, and we can write some kind of nice, fancy little sugarized constructor. So this monad, this is a static function that just wraps the object constructor. We can pass in some value, and it's going to return a new monad object. Um, and then we can just write a class method on this. Um, we can write a method on this class called bind, which takes a function as an argument. So then we can do things like with our monad objects, we can just call bind on it. Um, so let's take a look at those axioms that I just show, showed you before, um, but in OO form. So this is a lot easier to understand. So now we've got some kind of class monad. We've got our static unit method. Uh, so we can call that on a value. And this whole thing is essentially just going to return a new monad. And then we've got this bind um, method on that class, which we can then give a function. So again, you can see that's the equivalent of just saying, of just calling function on that value. And so then, if you try to bind the unit function to some monad, you're just going to get the monad back again. And finally, you can kind of see how this makes a lot more sense now. You can say that if you've got some monad, you bind function A, and then the result of that, you bind function B. That's the equivalent of just calling some function which on a value which returns a monad, binding a new function to it and then binding it to some monad originally. Again, that particular property isn't that interesting to us at the moment. We'll come back to it later. So let's try to put together this class now. So we've got some, we've right, our class definition. We've just got some value which we keep protected internally. And then in our constructor, we just pass in the value and we set that internally. So we just, we're just essentially just wrapping some value and keeping it safe, um, unprotected from the, um, untouchable from the outside. Um, and then we've just got some sugar around that constructor. We're just writing this static unit function. And you can see there it is just calling this constructor directly. There's nothing fancy about that. Um, it's just it's a nicer way to write it. And it's in keeping with the idea that a monad has a unit function. So you can be explicit about that rather than having, rather than having to call the constructor directly. Um, and then we're just going to implement that bind function as well. So the idea here is that you take some function as an argument, you call that on the value that you wrapped internally, and then with that result, um, we're just going to create a new monad out of that result. And that's got the luxury of meaning that this function doesn't have to necessarily understand about monads. It doesn't have to wrap the value that it returns within one. Um, and so just by implementing that bind function, we satisfy the, the first and the third axioms. Um, but we can just make a couple of little tweaks there. Um, the first we can do is just tweak that unit function. 
First of all, we're going to take a look at the value that we passed in. If that value is already a monad, we're just going to return it back. Uh, that satisfies the second axiom. And then finally, we're just going to write a little helper function here, which is just going to be a getter for that value that we wrapped internally. Um, and that's just nice when you have to leave this functional paradise and have to deal with imperative coding again. You can get the value back at the end of the transformations you're doing. So I'm going to approach the lectern now and attempt to do some live coding and show this in action. So, here's an example of this uh, class that we put together. Um, so that's exactly the same as you saw in the slides just now. And so now let's just ro open up a little uh, playground here. I can't see my first line. And so let's do something like, um, so let's call our unit function on some variable like 10. Then we're going to bind a function to it. And then within that function, we're going to get our value. And we're going to return our value divided by 2. And then let's bind another function to that resulting monad, that resulting value. And then let's just say return value times 5. And then finally, let's just get the, the result out of that. And then we're just going to inspect that result. Right, what are we going to get if I show you the code again? So what we got here, we're wrapping the number 10. We're going to divide it by 2, and then we're going to multiply it by 5, and then we're just going to get it back out. We should get 25. OK, so pretty straightforward stuff. And that's an incredibly obtuse and roundabout way of doing such a simple operation. <laughs> that, in, a, in and of itself, is not that useful. But what is useful is to take a look at the, the shape of this code. Look at the way that you get some kind of value, you call a bunch of functions on that value, and you, after every time you call a function, you're getting a new thing back, and at, at the end, you call some kind of operation to get the result of that. What you start to realize is that monads are everywhere. You've seen this code, you've been using this code for years. Um, anyone here you work with promises at all? Yeah, a couple of people. So the idea of a promise is that you perform some... So this is JavaScript code, by the way. Uh, let's say you've got some kind of asynchronous operation. Uh, before, you would have had to pass a horrible callback function in, and it starts getting messy. You have a pyramid of doom. Um, now you can just flatten this out. So you can say, do some asynchronous operation. Then, when it's completed, you pass in a function with a result. Do something with it. Return some kind of mutated form of that result. And then maybe hang something else off of it. Maybe you could do something else asynchronously and have this nice flat chain of all of these operations. And then maybe when you do have to dance with the devil, you can introduce a little bit of uh, external context like we're doing there. Um, anyone write in AngularJS? Yeah, so you know what that does. Um, and jQuery. Everyone's written jQuery. So again, you're just doing something like wrapping some kind of string, which represents a DOM selector. And then you get back some kind of DOM object wrapped with jQuery goodness so that you can do things like uh, setting CSS uh, style properties and modifying the HTML. And every time you perform one of these functions, you get a new DOM node back, which represents the DOM node after the transformation has been made. Um, low dash and underscore, two really powerful libraries for doing functional style programming in JavaScript. If you've got some kind of value, you can uh, say, let's say value is an array of objects. Um, you can filter those objects, you can sort them, you can reverse them after the sort, and then finally you can get the result of that operation back out. Um, and also, PHP has something similar. If you're looking at something like Doctrine and you're looking at maybe a query builder, um, you're doing something with this query builder object where you're specifying a table and some clauses, and then finally you run that query. Um, although it may not look like it when you're looking at the code, it's exerting some monad-style behavior. And so the interesting thing here is that 
we've been writing this sort of, we've been working with libraries that do this. We've probably been writing code like this ourselves for years. And we've been using monads all the time and we haven't had to understand Haskell or category theory or understand what a monoid is or an endofunctor. Um, we just write code that seems sensible. And so really, um, asking what is a monad um, is, ask, is like asking what is a musical instrument. It's an abstract thing. Uh, there's no concrete definition um, of exactly what every monad is. But they're essentially, so monads are really just a category of different design patterns that come in different flavors. Um, and what we've been looking at so far is the identity monad. And that's why it's not much practical use to us, because it is such, it's the simplest form. And you have to understand that to move on to the others. So there are some others that are more interesting to us. Uh, maybe, the maybe monad is really interesting. Uh, list is great, in, great for working with uh, some data where you don't know whether it's a collection of data or whether it's just a single item. Um, the IO monad perhaps may be of some benefit to PHP developers, but Haskell relies on it. If you ever want to talk to the outside world in Haskell, you have to use the IO monad. Um, and then you've got deferred, and, uh, or also known as the promise, and there are a whole bunch more. Um, but I just want to wrap up tonight by just quickly talking about the maybe monad. Um, first of all, I want to apologize for the title of that slide. Um, the maybe monad is a really great way of handling um, a value that may be potentially null. Um, and so you end up having to write code where you've got null checks all over the place, and the maybe monad can eliminate that. So let's say that you've got some kind of tree style data structure where you have these nodes within a tree and each node has a name and it has a parent. And so then let's say that for a given node, uh, you want to get the name of the grandparent node. So what you would do is take that, that node, get the parent, then get that parent, then get the name. Now, what happens if that parent doesn't have, a, if that node doesn't have a parent or if its parent doesn't have, have a parent? You have to write, or you have to pollute your code of all this kind of stuff. You have to First of all, explicitly get that parent node, check if it's null, and if it is, get out of there. And then the same thing for the grandparent. Again, so you've just got this whole duplication, it just gets really messy. And then if you finally satisfied the criteria of these amazing co conditional guard functions, then finally you can do what you were actually trying to do in that function. And this is all over the place. Whenever, if you want to write code that is safe and isn't going to result in runtime errors, then you've got to do this kind of stuff all over the place. And it gets really frustrating, and it really clouds the intent of what you're actually, this is what you're actually trying to do, but you have to do all of this in order to make your code safe. And so the maybe monad can come to save us in that case. Um, so what we do is we essentially just write a new monad that extends our original identity monad, and all we do is just tweak the bind function. And all we do is take a look at our wrapped value. If it's null, just return the original monad, and if not, just go ahead and call the existing bind implementation, and that's it. That is, that null check there is the last null check that you'll ever need to write, maybe. So, um, I got three minutes to quickly do another live coding. I'm not really gonna live code it, I'm just gonna show you one that I prepared earlier. So, um, here's our maybe monad that we had before. Um, so, Here's our tree node class, and you can see there we've got that grandparent name. And this is the thing where we would have to add all of the null checking. So if I wanted to maybe do something like, so I've got an example here where I'm creating some tree nodes. Um, I've got one there that doesn't have a parent. I've got one there that does have a parent, and then another one there that has a parent. So if I want to say, so if I want to run that example now, So that will return OK because the element, the, the node that we specified there has a grandparent, so it'll work just fine. But if I use one that doesn't have a grandparent, we're going to get a bunch of warnings and that could lead to other kinds of nasty stuff. Obviously, the solution there is just turn off notices. <laughs> um, but so what, we can, what can we do here? We can adapt this grandparent name method to use a maybe monad instead. So here is an example where we use maybe instead. So what we do here is we just wrap that get parent within some kind of uh, anonymous function here, and we do the same for get name. 
And so then what we can do is we can wrap ourselves in a maybe, and then we can bind our get parent function twice, and then bind the get name function, and finally get the value out. And so if I now show you example three, you can see there that the actual implementation there from our sort of user land code, if you will, hasn't changed at all. And so if we run that now, example three, so you'll see for that example, that works fine. And then if I specify some node that doesn't have a parent or doesn't have a grandparent, you'll see that we just get a null back, but there's no runtime error there. Because what's happening is we're attempting to get the grandparent, that's coming back as null, and because that value is, that wrapped value is now null, the additional bind functions aren't going to be called anymore. So it's a great way of short circuiting all that kind of logic without having to explicitly write a bunch of guard functions, all over, uh, guard conditions all over the place. And so again, we can go as many levels deep as we like. There I've just set that to the, the top level one there that won't even have a parent, let alone a grandparent. And you can see we still get a null back, but without having to worry about runtime errors. So can I go on a little longer, Steve, just a minute or two? Um, there's a couple of little extensions. I'm not going to demonstrate those, but you could do something that if you're going to be exclusively dealing with objects, maybe you could write a new extension of maybe Monad. Um, I've just got a little helper function in here called call and another one called prop. And so you can do something like um, have just like a generic method calling function. And you could also have, that's an error. There should be a dollar sign in front of name. And there should be a dollar sign in front of prop. Um, but you can get the idea here. So what we can actually do, let me just quickly show you how that would work. We could essentially replace this code here, get rid of all of these functions, and we could maybe say something like, okay, and so now, We've got that original intent back that we had before, but without a whole bunch of null checking all over the place. Um, and that, I think, is really powerful and fantastic, really. Um, and you don't have to be a Haskell-speaking mystic to understand what's going on there, which I think is fantastic. Um, so what have we learned? Um, these mystical monad things, they're just, a, it's just design patterns. Um, we've be, we've already, we're already using them. The most common forms of these monads have really simple implementations. You've seen that I've been able to fit them on less than a screen. Um, and you don't need that Haskell and the higher level mathematical background in order to get it. Um, I did A-level maths. I got a C and it nearly killed me just to get that. And this stuff is fantastic, I think. So um, that doesn't mean that you should not entertain the idea of playing with a language like Haskell. Um, I think it can really extend your knowledge beyond the basics that we've looked at tonight, and you can really tear into it and really exploit these principles even further. Um, so just feel free to go ahead and play and learn something that perhaps you wouldn't have looked at before. Um, there's a couple of resources that you might find useful. Uh, Crockford, who I mentioned earlier, talking about gonads and monads. Uh, mostly monads, not so much gonads. Um, that's a fantastic talk. Um, he explains it really well. It's got a very much JavaScript focus, but um, I really like his presentational style. Um, IRC Maxwell um, talked about this well, like two years ago almost now, um, and his implementation was very similar to mine. Um, of course, I came up with it independently in a white room situation. I didn't lift any of his code as an example. Um, and finally, if you do want to maybe play with um, a higher level functional programming language, learnyouahaskell.com. I'm sort of like halfway through this at the moment, and it does make my head hurt a lot at times, but I think it's making me a better programmer for learning something like that, even if I'm never going to write any real code in it. So on that, I'm going to say thank you very much and uh, ask for questions. Any at all? Have I blown everyone's fuses? Yes. It's pretty much a fluent helper. Yeah, yeah, it's a fluent interface in a way, but what you're looking for there is something that doesn't mutate the original thing. When, so you wrap your original value, and then when you're returning it after each method call, you're returning a new monad. You're not just mutating the original thing and returning yourself again. You are returning a new wrapper. Um, but yeah, it, it does look a lot like the Fluent interface. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, you could cheat and use by reference. If you pass as an object, you would have to make sure that it's a copy. Right, yeah, you would need to clone the object. Yeah, I didn't consider that, but yes, that's, that's certainly true. You would probably want to make some kind of uh, guarantees about immutability there. Any more questions? No, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>